So let me get the. This meeting is being recorded. Um, 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 boom, boom. Can you guys uh, see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to be uh, covering tonight in our uh, 90 minutes the seven most tested option strategies on Series 7. If you're here for your SIE, it's uh, the same seven you're held accountable for. You just won't get the depth and you won't get the uh, uh, the numbers of performance opportunities. So that's what I call test questions. So you're gonna have about 20 uh, option questions, give or take. And this is where the uh, action is at, uh, so to speak. So what we're gonna be covering uh, this evening is the basic positions, long call, short call, long put, short put. You know, this is the only discussion uh, on your series seven that builds. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're lost on step one and you're gonna be lost on step three, everything else on series seven, if you don't get it, who cares? Because 20 minutes later, something else will be new and you can attack that as your, your new thing to do. Now, once we get through the basic positions, talking about max gain, max loss, break even suitability, then we'll finish up by talking about stock positions plus option positions. We'll be talking about a covered call or buy right where we're long the stock and we're gonna generate some additional income. We'll be talking about how to protect a long stock position. And then we're gonna talk about how to not be foolish. Don't be what I call a dumb bear, how to be a smart bear, how to make sure you're not taking unlimited risk in a short stock position. So that's kind of our agenda for this evening. In terms of housekeeping, uh, I wanna thank you in advance for participating this evening. And I've been trying to work out you know, what is our community going to exist in uh, these classes? So the first thing I want to let you know, as soon as this is done, I'll put another one on the schedule and you're going to get free repeats for any classes that you take. So, okay, so if you're not testing you're not until April help. or May, by, by the way, it'll ask you to pay. So you just have to send me an email so I can, you know, manually override the, you know, making you pay before you get the link. Uh, but you'll get free repeats on that. The other thing I've uh, added is an office hour. It's only for paid students. It's not for people who you know are attending the live stream and join us for free, but for paid students, there's an office hour there where you can register. It's on the schedule now. And uh, kind of like what we did last night in the live stream, you can tell me what you want to talk about. Maybe you're the only person who shows up and it's just us, or maybe five people show up. Again, I'm keeping these capped uh, at about 10. I think that one I got capped at five. I haven't decided the frequency of that because I'm trying to make sure that I do, uh, can sustain whatever frequency it is I offer, right? So, I mean, you know, I'm doing these back to back every week and that's not going to be something that works longer term, but maybe every three or four weeks uh, I'd be doing that. So in, in the office hour, maybe every other week, there's a free office hour that you can sign up for and, uh, you know, the same thing, show up on a Zoom and we do kind of what we're doing now. Okay, so let's get started on the content we're going to be discussing this evening. You know, I think a lot of people get hung up because they think there's a zillion types of option contracts and strategies, and that's not true. There's only two types of contracts, calls and puts. That's it. And you can either buy them or you can sell them. So that means we have four basic option strategies. And you're already familiar with contracts outside of the securities industry, right? Contracts always have two parties. Somebody who's paying the consideration, somebody who's receiving the consideration. I was teasing Tracy earlier, right? You guys have gone long this class. You did an opening purchase of $40. You paid a premium. I'm the other side, right? I did an opening sale. I received the premium. I'm obligated. You know, if I didn't want to be obligated to spend 90 minutes with you on a Wednesday, I shouldn't have collected the premium. You know, um, there was a car that was not available yet. It was gonna be out on a win issued basis. Doesn't exist yet. And I went to the car dealer and I said, listen, I love that car. He goes, well, Dean, you know, it's not, it's not available. I mean, it doesn't exist. I said, I know. I would like to be able to buy that on a win issued basis. You know, I would like to give you $3,000. The car dealer says, what's the catch? You know, people don't give you money unless there's some kind of catch. I said, for this $3,000, I want to have a choice to call away from you that automobile for $25,000. He said, well, Dean, uh, you know, the manufacturer suggested retail price is twenty four. dollars I said, well, I know. And if I thought you were going to sell that at twenty four, dollars I wouldn't be offering you $3,000 right now. You know, if it's $24,000 off the boat from Japan, 
you know, then I'm not going to exercise that call contract. And he says, okay, I'll do it. Now, I definitely want something in written form from you. I, car dealer, agree to sell said vehicle for $25,000. Now, several months later, he calls me and he says, Dean, the car is here. He said, I'd like to talk to you. I said, well, I'm on my way. He's in Long Beach. I'm in San Francisco. Uh, he said, Dean, I just came off the truck and I had an offer for 32. How about I give you five grand to go away? You know, I don't want to have to deliver the car to you. I said, well, listen, you must think I'm new. I have a choice to call that away from you at 25. You just told me the car is worth 32. My contract is worth $7,000 intrinsically. If I was going to walk, I'd want at least $7,000. Yes, I'd actually like a little extra because of all the time value involved. Unfortunately for you, Mr. Carter, I'm going to exercise. So that means I paid $25,000 for the car, $3,000 for the contract. So $28,000 is uh, my break even. Now, in our evening together, the underlying interest is not going to be an automobile. The underlying interest is going to be a stock. As I said, we have two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can either buy them or sell them. So we have four basic positions. Now, we have put contracts outside the securities industry. You know, I was leasing a high-end automobile, and the guy told me at the end of the lease, car dealer, the car is going to be worth $60,000 or more. I go, really? I said, you and I have opposite expectations about the value of the automobile. You are telling me that this car is going to be worth $60,000 or more, and I think less than sixty. dollars He goes, well, Dean, what's the catch? I said, well, listen, whenever there's two parties like us that have opposite expectations about something, we can make a bet. So what I'd like to do is give you $4,000. Again, he says, what's the catch? People don't give you money unless there's some kind of catch. Right? If somebody goes to hand you a bunch of cash, you got to say, what's the catch? You know, what's the obligation? You know, I, I'm an NBA fan, right? You know, I, Steph Curry, will play basketball for $40 million a year. That's a two-party contract, right? The Warriors are holding that contract. Anyways, in this example, I said, hey, I, for $4,000, uh, what I want to be able to do is uh, put the vehicle to you at the end of the lease. I'd like to have the choice to sell or put to you the car at the end of the lease. He said, well, Dean, what if the car's, you know, 60,000 or higher? I said, well, at the end of the lease, if the car's like 70 grand, I'm gonna sell the auto trader. I ain't gonna stick it to you at 60. And you'll get to keep the premium. And he says, hmm. Now on this car dealer, I couldn't get him to go for it. But if I did, if he did, I'd want something in written form from him. I car dealer agreed to uh, buy said vehicle for $60,000. So let's say it's the end of the lease and the car is worth $40,000. And he's sitting on his lot. He goes, I wonder if Dean's going to show up today. So uh, do you think Dean's going to show up? If Dean is sitting on a choice to sell the automobile for $60,000 and the car is worth 40, should he have the expectation that I'm going to show up and make him perform on this contract? Absolutely. He says, Dean, you're making me pay 60 for a car that's only worth 40. I go, yep. That's exactly what I'm doing. And he says, man, I'm gonna lose 20 grand. I go, no, you get to keep the four, so you're only gonna lose 16. He says, man, you're so good at my loss. I said, well, your loss is my gain. Now, as you can see here, I have on the screen for you, not a box with four squares. I have a matrix and we're gonna be working our way through this matrix and every one of these quadrants is somehow related. Now, as I said, the difference between my analogy and what we're gonna be discussing is the underlying interest, that's the thing we're betting on, is not gonna be an automobile. Right, I got a horse right here. His name is Paul Revere. Can do, can do. That's not a song about a guy who owns the horse. It's a song about a guy betting on the horse. The horse we're going to be betting on this evening is Apple. So we're going to be buying a uh, long call on Apple. We're going to have a choice to buy the Apple stock. We're going to go over the max gain. That's why it's empty because we haven't done it yet. We're going to go over the break even. We haven't done it yet. We're going to go over bullish or bearish on each of these four. What I do want to point out that before we start is even in my analogy, you know that the worst case is you pay a premium, you're going to lose it, right? The worst case is you paid $40 for this 90 minutes and you get nothing out of it. So one of the advantages of buying a call or a put 
is if you're wrong, you're just going to lose your premium. We're going to go over that at length. And when you sell an option contract, when you sell the option contract, the best case is you agree to be a potential victim and nobody victimizes you. You get to go neener, neener, neener. You get to keep the money. All right, so let's get started on our first uh, uh, strategy here. Long and Apple, August 150 call at nine. Now, uh, this morning or today, Apple is uh, 154. So let's put that there. CMP means current market price. You know, it's kind of like learning a foreign language. They say when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know the foreign language. So let's just go through this uh, shortly uh, here long. Now, on the test, they might not say long. They might say, you buy the option, you're the holder of the option, you're the owner of the option. Now they might say you did an opening purchase. What will they say on the test? Whatever you're not prepared for. Now, the one thing they're not gonna say on the test, and this is the big thing that I want us to know, is when we hear the word buyer, owner, holder, opening purchase, the word we've got to get to is the word choice. That's the one thing they're not going to say on the test is that you have a choice. That's what options are, choices. So that's what that word means. Now, some people like to use the word right, R-I-G-H-T. That's fine. It doesn't matter because they're not going to use either on the test. But I don't like to use the word right, R-I-G-H-T, because I don't like it floating around in my brain housing group with the word right, W-R-I-T-E, which means the opposite thing. So we're long one, very important. Each of these option contracts governs 100 shares. So I'm in control, please note, I don't own 100 shares of Apple. I'm in control of 100 shares of Apple. If I wanted to be in control of 1,000 shares of Apple, I would be 10 contracts. If I want to be in control of 500 con uh, shares of Apple, that'd be five contracts. Each of these contracts governs 100 shares. That's called the multiplier, the multiplier. So I have a choice. I'm in control of 100 shares of Apple. Apple is the underlying interest, the thing we're betting on. You know, the underlying interest could be a stock. It could be an index. You know, I, my example could be, you know, in a horse race, it's a horse, right? You know, if I go to a dog track, they say, you know how it works? I go, let me guess. We're going to set the dogs loose. They're going to run around the track. You say, you've been here before. I said, well, no, but I've been to a horse race and where the underlying interest is a horse or a pooch it kind of works the same way, right? So that's the underlying interest, the thing we're betting on. Now, there are certain test questions that if you miss, you should just uh, flunk the entire test immediately. I mean, I would just have a seat and it would shoot you, your seat would shoot you into the ceiling if you miss this. August is the expiration date. Chat is open. Uh, yes, there will be a recording available. This is being recorded as we speak, and I will send it to you directly, or you can find the replay on the channel, whatever floats your boat. Or you can get permission to record it yourself, so however you want to do it. Um, I try and pay attention to the chat. Did I miss anything else in the chat? Yeah, Tracy, I think I gave you permission, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. If you say direct message, I don't mean to read it to the rest of you should, Tracy, I think I gave you permission. If not, just ask me again and I'll, I'll give you permission again. Okay, so when chat is open, that's why I looked at chat. Does anybody know based on pre-study when the uh, August, when this contract is going to expire? Chat is open. You can just put in chat. Don't unmute yourself because we'll have 10 people. You got to be tighter than the third Friday. You got to be tighter than the third Friday. You know, third Friday, you're on the right track, but on the test, you're going to have to be tighter than the third Friday. Nope, Elizabeth. Nope, nope, nope. 11, uh, there we go, Jessica. You got it. 4.30 is when, you know, you have to give exercise instructions. They expire at 11.59 Eastern time on the Saturday, or excuse me, the third Friday of the expiry month. So that's very testable. Uh, you know, the three styles of questions you get on the exam are recognition, practical application, and uh, judgment questions. And you can't be giving up recognition questions. I mean, those are you know the easiest kind of questions that you're gonna encounter on the series seven. 
Uh, if you're on your X, X, uh, your SIE, it's the same thing. Uh, it's testable on the SIE, and you get a lot more of the recognition style questions on the SIE than you do uh, on the uh, Series 7, right? So very important. A 150 is the strike price. So here I have a choice to call away 100 shares of Apple at any time. That's important, at any time at any time. You know, I gave you an analogy earlier. And as you recall in the analogy, I couldn't stick the car to the dealer until the end of the lease. Now, this, I just told you, we can exercise any time. Chat is open. Does anybody know the difference between option contracts that you can exercise any time, like equity options? So anytime I want, I can make somebody deliver 100 shares of Apple at 150. Anybody know the difference between those two? Very testable. That's called American style. Equity options are American style, meaning the holder can exercise any time. The other style, very testable, is European style. Now listen, if you're struggling on options, you want to make sure that you get all the aim and shoot point and click stuff that you're entitled to, right? So I had somebody who was really struggling. I said, well, of your 20 option questions on series seven, a lot of it is gonna be, you know, aim and shoot point and click stuff, like when do options expire? You know, uh, the difference between American style and European style. I just told you American style is typical of equity options. European style is more typical of non-equity options, indexes, things like that. So uh, here's our strike price of 150. It's a call contract. So we just said there's two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can either buy them or sell them. So, you know, we have, you know, four basic positions. Nine is the premium that we pay. So now we need to do what's called our initial setup. So, you know, we have our three T's here. You can do it any way you want. It's a buffet. But if you can look at the contract specification, what I mean by that is when you look at this, you're, you know, by the way, I highly recommend you do this. You know, one thing I would recommend to you is that underneath the option leg, you write what you're looking at. And what we said you're looking at here is a choice to buy the stock at the strike price. XP means strike price. And the reason that's so important is because otherwise you're just going to be staring at this and going, I don't know. And what you want to be able to do is kind of put this on your scratch paper so you can uh, make the analysis of it. So let me just give you the test phraseology. They'd say, your customer goes long, one Apple, August 150 call at nine, when Apple's at 154. What is the break even? Your customer goes long, one Apple, August 150 call at nine, when Apple's 154, at expiration. Uh, your customer goes long, one Apple, August 150 call at nine, when Apple's at 154. Several weeks later, Apple's trading at. Now, by the way, it doesn't matter that Apple's at 154 when we do this trade. It matters where Apple's at when we close the trade. Now, as we go through our first thing we're gonna talk about, break even in a long call. One thing we want to discuss is this idea of memorizing things. Uh, you can simply memorize if you want, and you know it's your choice, it's a buffet. You can simply memorize that the break even in calls is strike price plus premium. You know, that, that's up to you. And if you want to do that, there's no problem with that. And, you know, I'm just going to warn you, though, if that's the road you choose, the amount of stuff you're going to need to memorize is going to continue to grow. You know, because there's nine option strategies. I would prefer, you know, as your teacher, trainer, tutor, you know, whatever that uh, you had a general understanding, because if you understand it to a certain extent, you have to don't have to memorize as much stuff. So that's one way we could proceed is by simply memorizing our break even. Now, the other way I like to proceed is I like to take it off of the paragraph I'm looking at on the test. They say your customer's long, one Apple, August 150, call at nine, when Apple's at 154. And I like to make a T and I like to track the money. 
Breakeven is always expressed as a per share number. So I'm not gonna put 900 here, I'm gonna put nine. So I'm out nine points for that uh, contract. And I, uh, if I exercise the contract, I'd be paying 150 for the Apple. Now, if you get good at tracking money in and out, then you can simply shop your answer set on the test, looking for the number that if you plug it in would make the columns balance, right? In other words, I'm looking through my answer set here and one of my choices is 159. I say, oh yeah, that works. If I buy the stock at 150 and I pay nine to do so, and I exercise and sell the stock, I would break even. Nobody does things to break even, but I'm just illustrating that indeed that is the break even. You know, well, let's talk about buying Apple the stock. If you bought 100 shares of Apple today at 154, that would cost you $15,400. And here you only have to pay 900. Woo. Now, how would you like to control thousands of dollars of Apple stock? with as little as $900. That sounds pretty bueno. When you buy Apple the stock, you only have to be right about one thing, direction, up. And you have forever to be right. But when you want, buy an option contract, you gotta be right about three things. Here we gotta be right about direction, we're bullish. We wouldn't establish the choice to buy the stock unless we thought the stock was going up. Right, so this is a bullish transaction. If you're gonna memorize break-evens, by the way, I highly recommend that next to your break-even, you make a little note about where you want the Apple stock to be in relationship to your break-even. So that is our break-even, and there's a good memory aid device is call up, strike price plus premium. All right, so that's our break-even. Nobody does things to break even. Let's look at our max gain. Now there's a, sub, a couple of ways to phrase this. So again, if you memorize it, you can simply look at uh, the stock price 159 and say, well, how far up could it go from 159? There's potential infinite demand of Apple stock, infinite demand, and there's finite supply represented by the authorized shares. So again, our max gain is unlimited and you can simply memorize that. And as I warned you, if that's what you're gonna do, start memorizing stuff, the amount of stuff that you're gonna have to memorize is going to continue to compound. Now, by the way, that does sound pretty cool. I mean, how with as little as $900 of risk would you like unlimited reward potential? That sounds bueno, right? Now, what I would like us to be able to do though, however, is I'd like us to be able to track money because uh, what we want to be able to do here is kind of say, okay, what does this look like in terms of closing this out? So again, very important. There's three things that can happen to this option contract. So this question is going to end on your exam with one of three things. Now, whenever there's three of a thing, you want to be prepared for the accept format. The accept format. This option contract can be traded. This option contract can be exercised. This option contract can expire. Now, I'm not under any obligation on the test to tell you at expiration whether the contract got exercised or whether the contract expired. Because, you know, as a test taker, we should know that if at expiration, the contract is in the money, if the contract has intrinsic value, the contract will be exercised. All right, let's do some test phraseology. Your a customer goes long, one Apple, August 150 call at nine. At expiration, when Apple's at 154, who cares? At expiration, Apple is 168. So as we said, one thing you can do is simply memorize your break even and say, well, 168, is uh, nine points in the right direction. That's simply something you could do is just memorize it. You know, but if you can track the T, you'd say, okay, well, that means I'm definitely gonna exercise. Uh, P.S., even if you don't exercise, your broker will do it for you. 
you know, your brokerage firm says, well, why would you not want us to do that for you? So in your option agreement, there's limited discretion as to doing that. We're going to sell the stock at 168 and we are big time winners. Uh, that's bueno. You know, if I track that, that means I made nine points, right? And, you know, again, you could, if you're doing the T, I'm, I'm a little careful of subtotaling things because, you know, I want to make sure I, I know what numbers come from the question that I'm doing on the test and what numbers I'm introducing. But what I'm saying here is you can simply now net the T and part of its process again and say, okay, well, I'm out 159, nine points for the option contract and 150 for the Apple. So I'm out 159 and I sold the Apple for 168. That's another way to proceed in terms of getting that number. You know, however you get there, you need to get there is the point. But that being said, as I said, you could memorize this and uh, you could say that uh, that works. Remember, we have to get past 159 uh, to make this work. Okay, let's try another version of this same question. And intellectually, I'm about to ask you the same question. Uh, before I intellectually ask you the same question with different phraseology, uh, could this have been better? Absolutely, right? Apple could be 180 or 190. I mean, Apple is a very volatile stock and that's good when I buy an option because I'm buying the volatility. Volatility is my friend. I need volatility, I need volatility. Okay, this is the same question just asked a little differently. Same question asked a little differently. Your customer goes long one Apple, August 150, call at nine, when Apple's at 154. That has nothing to do with answering the question. You know, at 154, the 150 call has four points of intrinsic value. My choice to buy at 150 with the stock at 154 is worth four points. I paid nine. That difference is called the time value. I wouldn't worry about time value as it relates to taking the test because, you know, time value, they don't really get into. But what they do like to say on the test is you close out at intrinsic value. You close out at intrinsic value. So this is where it becomes important for us to know that the way we're going to trade the option contract is here we did what's called an opening purchase. That's very testable, by the way. An opening purchase test question is used to establish or add to a long position. And so you definitely need to know that opening purchases are used to add to uh, open or add to a long position. So the way we're going to get out of that right on, I see in the chat, you guys are right on this closing sale. And again, that's important. So same test question we just did. We're just saying the phraseology is a little, a little different. Your customer goes long, one Apple, August 150 call at nine, when Apple's at 154. Several weeks later, several weeks later, Apple's at 168. And your customer closes out at intrinsic value. Closes out at intrinsic value. Now be careful what you're being asked on the test. If I ask you what is the intrinsic value of a 150 call with a stock at 168, that's 18 points. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking that if your customer closes out at that, now remember you could just memorize that, what is the gain or loss? And if I close that out at 18, because that's the intrinsic value, Ooh, bueno. Okay, pay attention. Here's where we're at so far in the first of our strategies. We're doing a long call. We said the break even in a long call, strike price plus premium. We said one way to proceed is to simply memorize call up, strike price plus premium. Please, please know call up is also great memory aid for intrinsic value. If the market price is up from the strike price, the contract has intrinsic value. Be careful, I didn't ask what's the intrinsic value of a 150 call with the stock at 168. You could either memorize that, or you could say, is it likely Dean wants to call the stock away at 150 when the stock's at 168? The answer is yes. And if you ask that framing question, yes, that means it has intrinsic value. And the money, intrinsic value are synonymous. Now, if I had bought Apple at 154 and Apple was 168, uh, I'm a winner. I would have made 14 points. So if I had bought Apple the stock, 
at 154 and Apple's at 168, I'm a winner. I made 14 points. That's better than the nine points I made here. Does anybody recognize the distinction between both of us are winners, both of us are happy bulls. The guy who bought the Apple stock at 154 with Apple 168 is a happy bull. And the guy who bought an Apple 150 call nine and Apple's 168 is a happy bull. What's the difference between those two bulls? Suitability, leverage. One reason people buy options is leverage. Leverage means making a little money do a lot. The guy who bought the stock, remember, put up $15,400. And for that $15,400, he made 14 points. And that's a good return, 1,400 divided by whatever that is. That's a good return. I put up nine, I made nine. I made 100%. I doubled my money. woo -hoo! Now, we should warn customers that the same supercharged speed they make money with is the same supercharged speed they're going to lose money with, right? So uh, in between what two prices, so let's look at our max loss now. Uh, the worst case is, the worst case is I pay nine points for the option and Apple is 150 or lower and the contract expires. And again, that sounds like a bad thing, but that's not a bad thing because you know, the floor is 150, you know, so, you know, pretty easy to qualify. Somebody wants to buy an option contract. Is this $900 you can afford to lose? You know, the guy who buys the Apple stock at 154 could lose 15,400, right? You know, maybe the iPhones, uh, the supply line in China gets broken again, and uh, they have to recall a bunch of iPhones or whatever, and the stock tanks to 120. You know, the guy who's got the stock is going to have greater risk than I hear, have here. So it sounds like a bad thing, but it's a good thing. All I can lose is my premium. Uh, in between what two prices would I lose money, but not my entire premium? In between what two prices would I lose money, but not my entire premium? In between what two prices would I lose money, but not my entire premium? Well, between 150 and 159, so let's try that. Current market pricing. Again, test phraseology. Your customer goes long, one Apple, 150 call at nine. When Apple's 154. At expiration, Apple remains unchanged. Apple remains unchanged. That means Apple's still at 154. Am I going to exercise the contract? I am to get back at least some of my money. You know, and here uh, I'm a loser. I didn't lose all my money because, you know, the, the contract still had some intrinsic value, right? So between 150 and 159, I'm going to lose my money, but not my entire premium, right? If it remains on change, that's not going to be bueno. Now, some people are visual people, so let me just show you visual, visual representation of this. There's no graphing on the test, but there is our Apple, right? And uh, it's a 150 call, and if Apple's 150 or lower, the contract has no intrinsic value. You know, if I really wanted to teach you options, I'd make you buy one, and once you were out of pocket, you'd figure out pretty quickly how this works. So you got to cover your out-of-pocket costs, right? So here's my out-of-pocket cost. I'm out of pocket. Whoa. I'm out of pocket. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's my break even of 159. And as we said, in between these two prices, I'm a loser. Right? But once I get past 159 then life is good, right? Because once I get past that, then I start to make some money. Now we said when we are doing the trade, Apple is 154. And we said, if the market price is above the strike price, the contract has intrinsic value, right? So that's just a visual representation of this. So right now we said Apple is 154. And we said the strike price is 150. 
Uh, chat is open. Chat is open. Uh, I have a choice to buy at 150. I have a choice to buy at 150. Uh, what if we were looking at what if we were looking at a 145 call? You know, what's more desirable? A choice to buy Apple at 150 or a choice to buy Apple at 145? What is more desirable? 145. And what's more desirable? A choice to buy Apple at 150 or a choice to buy Apple at 155? What's more desirable? A choice to buy at 150 or 155? Yeah. So, you know, if we were looking at our quote machine, you know, one thing we would want to make a note of, it's not a big deal in these seven we're doing to, uh, today, but next Wednesday when we're doing multiple option strategies, uh, that would be important. So one important note I want you to make is that lower strike call contracts always have greater premiums. You know, it makes sense because a, a choice to buy at a lower price is always more desirable. Uh, by the way, in terms of taking notes, this is being recorded, but you know, I would suggest that anything being bright on the slide is probably good fodder for you to make uh, notes. I would definitely have notes as we're going through these strategies. Okay, so we have now filled in uh, the entire part of this first strategy here. And one thing I would like you to be able to do, let me clean up my slide here, is uh, I'd like you to memorize the matrix. So now we have memorized the first quadrant of that matrix. I say, what can you tell me about a long call? You say, Dean, when you're long the call, you paid a premium. You have a choice to buy the stock at the strike price. Your max gain is unlimited. Your max loss is the premium. You may not have any clue what you just said, but it's technically correct. You say you're bullish. And now you say the break even the strike price plus premium. You may not have any clue what you just said, but it's technically correct. Now, what I love about the matrix, not a box with four squares, is if you get this first part of the quadrant, what we just did down, I'm now gonna show you the next part of this. And the neat thing about the matrix is if you uh, don't even read this other side, you know that whatever went on the left side, the left side is gonna be the opposite, right? So it was an opening purchase. Yeah, when you're on the long call, it's an opening purchase. Anything on the left side of the matrix is an opening purchase. By the way, I'll just give you a visual representation again. And it's not a box with four squares. There's our strike of 150, right? There's our strike. And here was our break even of 159. I'm just superimposing the market value onto the matrix, right? And when we did this, it was 154. My point is this is not a box with four squares. So the next one I'm gonna show you, we're working our way through the most tested strategies, is I'm gonna show you the short call. You know, we already know that when we're short a call, whenever we're short an option, we've received the premium. And you either have an obligation to let somebody call the stock away from you, or you have an obligation to let somebody put the stock to you. We have two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can either buy them or sell them. So we have four basic positions. So now I'm just going to illustrate that through the uh, next strategy. So here's our next one. This one is really stupid, by the way. You know, don't be a dumb bear. This is really stupid. Now, what I would suggest you do, and again, you should have a process, is I said what I like to do is below each of the option legs, not testable, I like to say, what am I looking at? And what I'm looking at is an obligation to sell the stock at the strike price. Now, if you can't do that, then you're simply gonna be staring at these things going, I don't know, B, you know, you can't be doing that. You gotta attack these things. So that's what I like to do in terms of uh, process. I like to put underneath that. So let's put it in test phraseology. Let's put it in test phraseology. Your customer goes short one Apple, August 150 call at nine, when Apple's at 154. That has nothing to do with answering any question. We don't care where the stock's at when we do the trade. We care where the stock's at when we close the trade, right? So it doesn't matter where, what matters is several weeks later or at expiration, that's what we care about. Now, again, there's a lot of words to say short. You could say seller, you could say uh, writer, 
You know, what will they say on the test? Whatever you're not prepared for. You know, they could say opening a sale. That's very testable. Now, the way we create short positions is by doing an opening sale. Right? I did an opening sale on a 90-minute Series 7 option class, right? I've got a short position here. So I'm a potential victim. That's what I think of it. It's what Dean thinks isn't a test question. But I think of it as I'm a potential victim. If I didn't want to be a potential victim, I shouldn't have collected this money. So I'm a potential victim on how many shares of Apple? I'm a potential victim. Chat is open on how many shares of Apple? I'm a potential victim on how many shares of Apple, right on 100 shares. It was 10 contracts, I'd be a potential victim on 1,000 shares. Uh, Apple is the underlying interest. August, I'm a potential victim between any time between now and the third Friday, third Friday, 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. I'm a potential victim at 150. When I was a practitioner, I would make everybody who shorted an option contract sign a big boy or big girl letter saying, listen, I want you to understand something. If you get exercise, you're going to be delivering Apple at less than the current market price. And then, you know, when that happened and you said you didn't understand it, I whip out your big girl letter or big boy letter and say, well, here's the letter you signed saying that you understood when you wrote this contract. When you shorted this contract, you knew you were obliged to deliver the stock at the strike price. You know, that's what's going on here. I could kind of think it's like picking up nickels in front of bulldozers. The main thing you're supposed to tell clients is don't do this. There's a lot of smarter things we can do. We could do a covered call. We could do a credit call spread. The main thing is not to do this. Now, when we do our opening sale, this is going to be money in. So we're going to put that there in our T. I like to use the T. Now we said you don't have to be able to track money in and out. We said, if you choose to, you could simply memorize things. Now, what did Dean give you as a caveat about going down the memory road? You remember what my warning to you is about going down the memory road? If you go down the memory road, the amount of things you're gonna to have to memorize is gonna compound. Now be careful, I did say memorize the matrix. I think the matrix is kind of a nice thing to have as you go through your study efforts, and if you get good at it, you can actually you know, data dump that matrix when you get down to the exam site. You simply take a sheet of paper, fold it in fours, and there's your matrix. And if you can do the first quadrant, then you can do all the other quadrants, right, as you unfold it. And if you want to memorize break-evens, we said you can simply memorize that it's the stock price plus the premium. And that's a good way to proceed. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. And so then this example, that would be again, 150. It's the same breaking if you're long or short, same breaking. Just no matter where you want it to be, the stock in relationship to that breaking. And as I said, if you're gonna memorize break-evens, I highly recommend that you put an arrow next to your break-even to remind yourself whether you're bullish or bearish in relationship to that number. So this was an opening sale. And what I'm going to have to do if I get exercise, I'm going to have to deliver the Apple stock at the strike price. So we said break even the same numbers out as numbers in. Right? So if Apple is at 159, I'm just illustrating the break even, and I buy the Apple at 159 and I deliver at 150, I'd lose nine points on the stock, but I got nine points. I break even. Nobody does things to break even. But that is my break even. By the way, if you get good at the T, the other reason I like the T is because if you get good at the T and tracking money, in other words, you understand that break even. Break even is always expressed per share, by the way. So, you know, just by way of reminder, you know, when we go back, let's just go back here. You know, I told you when we're doing things, what, uh, there's our, when we're doing the, uh, this, and we said, for example, I just want to show you, uh, when we get done with the per share, we're going to have to multiply. Now, in the test, they won't ask you to do both, but I just want to show you that we had an example here where we had uh, we had bought the option for nine, and we sold the option for 18. And then what you got to remember is that that's going to be a nine-point profit, and it's going to be nine points on the test, or nine times one times 100. That's called the multiplier, $900.
So I suggest you do that multiplication when you're all done. Otherwise, you're going to be transposing zeros all over the place. So I would suggest doing it on a per share basis. Then when you're all done, figure out what's going on. All right. So the maximum gain, I think, is pretty straightforward when you sell an option contract. You agree to be a potential victim. Nobody victimizes you. You walk with the money. You go neener, neener, neener. Now, again, you could put, if you wanted, 900 in here, but I'm suggesting that what you should do is do this on a per share basis. And then when you're all done, you know, do that. You know, Path Perfect is notorious for this. And, you know, you're going to have thousands of dollars in and out and trying to track it. It's easier to do it per share and then when you're all done. So the best case here is the contract expires worthless. Neener, 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 right? And you get to keep the money. And remember that happens if Apple is below 150. So maximum gain you can memorize is the premium. And again, we could say nine points. They won't do both on the test. Nine points or $900. A guaranteed test question. Guaranteed test question. What is the maximum loss when you agree to sell stock you don't own? What is the maximum loss when you would agree to sell stock that you don't own? That is a guaranteed test question. You need to recognize on the test what's called a naked call. Sometimes we refer to this on the test as an uncovered call. And boy, that's uh, gonna be a big, not smart thing to do. Okay, so in our previous example, in our previous example, 168 was a dreamy price for the person who was long the call. In our previous example, 168 was a dreamy price for the guy who was long the call. So for the person who's short the call, is 168 going to be a dreamy price or a nightmarish price? It's going to be nightmarish, right? Because whatever is good news for the guy who's long, it's bad news for the short. This is a zero sum game. So let's do our thing at expiration. Remember our test phraseology? So you want to get you know more comfortable with test phraseology? I'm joking, but not really. You know, the Series 7 is kind of like learning a foreign language. And they say when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know it. So I guess when you have your first Series 7 dream, that's when you've arrived, right? So <laughs> anyways, um, you know, test phraseology. Customer shorts, one Apple, August 150 call at nine, when Apple's at 154. Do we care that Apple's 154 in this test question? Do we care that Apple's at 154? Yes or no? I'm reading the test question. It says that your customer is short one Apple, August 150, call at nine. When Apple's at 154, no, we don't care about that. We care about when it then says at expiration, Apple is. Now that's why the intrinsic value is so important, right? Because if they say at expiration, Apple's 150, uh, 150 or 145, the contract expires. And they say Apple's uh, 168, then we know that's going to be a problem. I'll play broker, you pay, play customer. I say, hey, you know that uh, 150 call you wrote? You say, yeah. I say, well, you know, it's the third Friday. You say, yeah. I say, listen, uh, you got exercised. And you say, I choose not to be exercised. I say, well, you're confused, my friend. You don't have a choice, you have an obligation. And you say, well, what if I had the stock? I said, well, you had the stock, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. If you had the stock, that would be a covered call and I would just have delivered the stock. That's one thing you've got to do as a test taker is read carefully to see if the person actually owns the underlying has the stock. That's a covered call. This is a naked, uncovered call. And you say, well, Dean, maybe the stock's less than 150. I said, well, again, you're confused. We wouldn't be having this discussion if the stock was less than 150. The stock is north of 150. The contract has intrinsic value and that's why you're being exercised. And you say, would you, what I got to do? I say, you got to deliver the stock. And you say, well, do you know where I can get the stock? I say, yeah, every day between 9.30 and four o'clock, there's a market. 
And you're going to have to go out and buy the stock at the market and deliver it. So you're going to buy the stock at 168. And you're going to deliver at 150. And again, that is a losing proposition. You say, well, thank God it couldn't have got worse. Sir. I said, well, you're a little confused, my friend. How much worse could it have got? It could have got unlimited worse, right? So this one sounds really foolish. The last one, how with limited risk, would you like unlimited gain? The short call is kind of silly. How with uh, limited uh, risk, would you uh, limited reward, would you like unlimited risk? Not bueno. So some people are visual, some people are visual. By the way, on the test, remember, this would be a loss of nine points or $900, right? So as I'm saying here again, ladies and gentlemen, you could put the zeros in there if you want to. I just think that makes this thing a lot na nastier in terms of trying to track things. So I'm suggesting that, you know, what you do is do it per share. And then when you're all done, you know, figure out what that is. That way you don't have to continually have to multiply, you know, across the, the T, so to speak. All right. So here's again, our uh, visual. Here's our visual. You know, we said that uh, the Apple, the market price uh, is was 168 in this example. And the strike price was 150. If the market price is up from the strike price, the contract has intrinsic value. And we said that's important because they throw that terminology around a lot on the test. And we said, if it's below 150, then there's not gonna be a problem. Now in our example, our break even remember was strike price plus premium. It's the same break even for both pure persons who are long and short. There's only one break even here. And it was 159 as our break even. You know, let's put that there. And when we did the, uh, the trade, who cares? Doesn't matter where it's at when we did the trade, but that's where the stock was when we did the trade. All right, so again, we're going to have a little bit of a cushion. I think of it as a cushion, you know, whatever kind of floats your boat, but I got a nine point cushion here, a nine point cushion. Before I got a problem. But once it goes past there, then I got a problem, right? Once it starts going past 159, then I got a problem. Now, every once in a while, I'll be teaching the class. Somebody go, well, it's not unlimited. It's unlimited less nine. Well, listen, unlimited less nine is unlimited, right? <laughs> Infinite. I can't tell you how much. If you come into my office and say, Dean, I want to lose so much money that you in advance can't tell me how much. I said, well, there's very few things that will cause you to lose unlimited sums of money. And this is certainly one of them. Very testable. So we've now finished our first two positions, long call, short call. As I've said, if you memorize the one quadrant, you don't have to memorize the second one, right? Right, because if you get the long call down, then all you got to know is every time you cross your matrix, every time you go across the line, they reverse, right? Right, so you only have one quadrant to actually kind of get down in terms of that matrix. Okay, so now we're going to move on to puts. Uh, anybody have any questions on the calls before we move on to our next two, which is a long put and a short put? Any uh, questions? You can unmute yourself if you do. Okay, so uh, in terms of strategy and process, Let's do trust phraseology. You know, what you're hoping is it sounds less and less of a foreign language rather than more and more. You know, my, my thing I always sign off with is inch by inch. You know, options are a sense, yard by yard. You know, options are hard. And you know what happens with options? Lights go on and they go out again. And then go on again and they go out again. Right? So you just got to keep working on getting that light lit and keeping it lit. Okay, so uh, we said there's a lot of words for long. We could have said buyer, owner, holder. So as a test taker, when you hear the word long owner, holder, buyer, the one word they're not going to say opening purchase, the one thing they're not going to say is what word do we need to get to as a test taker when we hear somebody bought the option, they're the holder of the option, they're the owner of the option, they did an opening purchase, what do we got to get to? What's the word that's not going to be provided that we need to get to? Chat is open. 
choice. That's exactly what I got, got to get to, choice. Or write R-I-G-H-T, you're in control. So uh, here, test phraseology, your customer goes long, one apple, August 150, put it nine. When apple's at 154, who cares? You know, we're going to do break even. If you only remember one thing about options, call up, put down. Call up, put down. Now, as I suggested, what I think you should do is every time you get an option underneath the leg, put what is it? Particularly if it's a put contract. This is a choice to put or a choice to sell the stock at the strike price. Particularly in puts. You know, people, it's okay. You know, people get confused. They go, I don't get it. I buy it to sell it. Those are different it's. When you buy a put contract dollars out, you're establishing the choice to sell the stock dollars in. So that's what I like to do there. As I like to say, okay, that's what I'm looking at is a choice to sell the stock at the strike price. So I have a choice to sell Apple at 150. And you should know that that's going to be an opening purchase. That's going to be an opening purchase. And again, break even is always expressed as a per share number. So I did my opening purchase for nine. You, if you want, you can put 900 in there if you want, up to you. And we said, if you want to memorize break-evens, you can certainly do that. This is strike price minus premium. That equals the break-even. And so in this example, that's going to be 150 minus nine. And that's going to be 141. You can certainly memorize that. If you're going to memorize break-evens, I have suggested that next to the break even, you put an arrow to remind yourself where you need the stock in relationship to that break even. Now, if you're gonna have a choice to sell the stock, and, and, you know, I don't know if I should tell you common mistakes, but people think debit positions, money out positions are bullish. That's not true. Here's an example of where you're paying money for a bearish position. And again, you don't want the tail wagging the dog here. So if you don't wanna memorize break evens, if you don't wanna memorize break evens, or if you want to just practice your skills, because if you get good at contract specifications and you can track money, at the point you can do that, you get 100% on options, right? So I paid nine points to be able to put the stock to somebody, stick the stock to somebody at 150. So the break even is going to be the number that would make the columns balance because that's what break even is. Same dollars out as dollars in. So, you know, I could simply shop my answer set on the test, A, B, C, D. Yeah, XP is strike price, so strike price less premium is my break even. And I could uh, just plug into the box all the choices they give me as a potential break even. And I say, yeah, so if I buy Apple at 141 and I stick it to somebody at 150, I'd make nine points, I paid nine points, I break even. Nobody does things to break even. People do things to make money. So my maximum gain. Well, uh, what I want to do is stick it to somebody at nine, or excuse me, at zero. So if I can make somebody give me 150 for worthless stock, that would be bueno. So I get 100 shares out of the trash can, and I stick it to somebody at 150. They say, Dean, you're making me pay 150 for worthless stock. I say, indeed, I am. You know, it's worthless. I say, I got it out of the trash can. Yeah. So the most I can make is when the stock goes all the way from the break even to zero, all the way from 141, all the way to zero. And again, you can simply memorize that, or you can, you know, get your T and track the money, you know, and how that looks. And again, I suggest you do things on a per share basis. So this would be 141 per share. But remember, we're talking about a contract. A contract, that's the one, one contract. And that contract governs 100 shares. And I suggest you do this at the very end, right? You multiply. Otherwise, you're going to have to multiply throughout the question. I just think you're very likely to transpose zeros on that. So that's $14,100 is my maximum gain. All right, so my max loss. You shouldn't be struggling with max loss. You should not be struggling with max loss. Is that a good thing or bad thing that uh, as a bear, this is a bearish position. Is that a good thing or bad thing that as a bear, 
you can lose nine points or nine hundred dollars. Is this a, a good thing or a bad thing that if you're wrong, you lose a max of nine hundred dollars? It's a good thing, right? Because if you, there are other things you could do that would be bearish, would be stupid, like a short stock position on an Apple. That's stupid. Unlimited risk. A naked call on Apple is stupid. So, you know, this is a smart bear. If you want to be a smart bear, you buy a put. Because if you buy a put and you're wrong, you just lose your premium, right? So as bearish positions go, this one is, uh, you know, smarter. Smarter than the average bear, so to speak, right? So now remember, the disadvantage of buying the option is you have to be right about three things. We said you got to be right about direction. You're buying volatility. You got to be right about downward volatility. You need the Apple to go down nine points. If you're short of the stock, you just need to go down. But here you got to be right about direction down, how far down, nine. Because you got to cover your out-of-pocket cost. You got to be right about the timing. Now, if we're going to have put errors, if we're going to have put errors, we got to have put ease, right? So there's going to be put errors. There's going to be put ease. But before we do that, I just want to show you the visual again. So here is a visual representation. I think of options as being about floors and ceilings. So, you know, as we just said, Apple uh, today is 154. Apple today is 154. So this is the 150 put on Apple that we're looking at. Does that Apple 150 put have intrinsic value today with Apple at 154? Yes or no? No. All it has is time value. So let's do test phraseology. Your customer goes long or long one Apple August 150 put at nine when Apple's at 154. At expiration, Apple remains unchanged. At expiration, Apple remains unchanged. So what's going to happen to that put contract that you bought if Apple remains unchanged? It's going to expire and you're going to lose your premium, right? So, you know, that's again what happens there. Now, what we need, right, is we need the stock to go down. So we said it's got to go from 154 all the way to 141. Now, here again is our break even. If you only remember one thing about options, what should you remember? Call up, put down. Here's our break even of 141. And again, in terms of a visual representation of that, again, I always got to cover my out-of-pocket cost. You know, as I joke with you, but right, if I really wanted to teach you options, I'd make you buy one. And once you were out of pocket, you'd figure out pretty quickly how this game works, right? How this game works is you got to be covering your out-of-pocket cost. As we said, you're happy. Once it goes past there, you've covered your out-of-pocket cost all the way to zero. Well, if we're going to have put errors, if we're going to have put errors, we got to have put ease. So if there's going to be put errors, there's going to be put ease. <laughs> I was teaching a class and the young lady said, this is the most unchristian thing I've ever heard of. Because, <laughs> you, know? you know, I said, hey, I'm going to stick the stock to you, right? So, you know, it's like car dealer, right? I'm going to stick the car to him at 60 when the car's at 40, you know? And she was saying that's an unchristian thing to do. And I kind of was joking. I said, well, you know, gee, <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's not what or it's the right thing to do. Uh, so again, we said in terms of proceeding, uh, what we should do is underneath the uh, option, like particularly puts, I don't make you feel any better, but puts are always the one that throw people for loop. So I highly recommend that underneath the option leg, you write, what are you looking at? You're looking at an obligation, oops, my bad, to buy. By the way, that's the other reason to have a, a process because you're more likely to catch your mistakes if you have a process. I can't tell you many people on the YouTube channel will you know, send me a text before they see me catch myself making a mistake and where I correct it, right? So 
I mean, you know, that's, you know, if you have a, if you don't have a process, you won't, you won't be able to do a self-diagnostic. All right, let's look at this one done. Short one apple, August 150, put at nine. When apples at 154, we don't care about that. We don't care where apples at when we do the trade. We care where apples at when we finish the trade. Now, as we said, you can simply memorize, call up and put down. Call up and put down are great mnemonics. We said they're great mnemonics, not only for the break even, but also for intrinsic value, right? If the market price is down from the strike price, puts have intrinsic value. It's also good for break even, put down. The break even in puts is strike price minus premium. So that's a good one for us to uh, you know, have uh, in our uh, arrow in our quiver. All right, so you can either memorize the break-even strike price minus premium, or you can fire up the T. You know, I, don't, I can't think of any reason you would not want to fire up a T. And again, this is where people get hung up. They go, Dean, I don't get it. I sell it to buy it. Those are different ads. When you sell a put contract, you are obligated to buy the stock. If you didn't want to be obligated to buy the stock, you shouldn't have uh, sold the put contract. Right? You're a potential victim at 150. Now, remember, once you get that done, then you can simply shop the answer set and say, okay, I need a break even, a number that if I plug it in there, will make the columns balance. Because that's what break even is, same dollars out as dollars in. So the break even is 141. And again, you can either memorize that or you can just, you know, remember you want to shop the answer set because you know that one of the four answers being offered to you is the right answer. The best case is you agree to be a potential victim. Nobody victimizes you. You know, 150 or higher, the contract expires and you go to go neener, neener, neener. Anytime you sell an option, the best case is you get to keep it. Right, that's the best case scenario, 150 or higher. Now, again, be careful, that's nine points. It won't be both on the test, but that's nine points on one contract governing 100 shares. So in total, that's gonna be $900. All right, so max loss. So you have an obligation to buy the Apple at 150. If you didn't want to have an obligation to buy the Apple at 150, you shouldn't have uh, collected that nine points. So what is the worst case scenario for you? So you're short an Apple, uh, August 150 put at nine. What is the worst case scenario? I'll play broker. Hey, Romeo, it's uh, Dean here. You go, yeah, Dean, what's up? I said, well, as you know, it's the third Friday in August. You say, and that means what? I said, well, remember, you were short an apple, August 150, put it nine. And you got exercised. He said, well, Dean, uh, so I got to buy it at 150. I go, yep. He goes, well, maybe it's higher than 150. I said, well, Romeo, you're confused. If, if Apple was higher, 150 or higher, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. The contract would have just expired and you would have go neener, neener, neener. You'd keep the $900. He says, oh. So Dean, you're telling me that Apple is somewhere lower than 150. He said, well, Dean, if it's a, uh, I'm hoping you're gonna tell me it's like 141 or higher. Because if it's 141 or higher, I, my cushion works, I still, I'm still okay. I go, that's exactly right, Romeo, but unfortunately it is not. The stock is less than 141. So what is the worst case? Romeo just paid 150 for Apple stock that is what? worthless, right? So right on, that's going to be 141. Again, I would do it per share. And then when you're all done, right? Times one times 100. Now, remember that's definable. That's definable. Uh, suitability here, suitability. You know, you might want to still do this, Romeo, because, you know, Romeo might want the Apple stock. So, you know, he might've said, hey, Dean, let's get paid to do something I'm already prepared to do. What's Apple at? I said, it's at 154. He goes, Dean, sell the 150 puts at nine. And then if I get put the stock, I'll be paying 141. And what I'm trying to do is get Apple less than today's current market price of 141. So, you know, one reason people might sell an option contract is to get paid to do something that they're already prepared to do. Right, Mr. Buffett loves to sell puts on stocks he's willing to own. And then when you put him the Bank of America stock, he goes, thanks, I wanted the stock anyways. All right, so we said our goal was to get through these uh, 
seven uh, test questions on this thing. And here's again, what this looks like visually. What this looks like visually is here's our break even. It's the same break even for both parties, 141. It's just a matter of where they want it in relationship to that break even. You know, in my example with uh, Romeo, he would want the stock, the Apple stock, to be in between 141 and 150. Ideally, he'd like it to be 150 or higher so the contract expires and he can keep the money. And if he's wrong, then it goes below here. Now, by the way, that's a lot of money, but it's definable. It's not unlimited is the point. And I can actually tell them how bad that can get. Okay, so the next thing we wanna be able to do is uh, there's again a summary. Do you have to know both these quadrants? Do you need to memorize both three and four? Do you need to memorize both three and four? No, because if you memorize three, then you know four is just the opposite. When that dawns on you, you have half as much to learn, right? So anytime you cross this, the gains and losses reverse, right? So that's why that matrix, it's not a box with four squares is the point, right? It's not a box with four squares. Everything's the opposite when you cross that line. All right, here's the matrix in all its glory. Here's the matrix in all its glory. Worth a snippet, you know, if you want to snip it or screenshot it or, you know, uh, I'm more than happy when we're done tonight. If you'd like, uh, uh, give me some time to do it because we got, what, 10 people? I'm, I'm more than happy to send you this deck if you'd like. All right, so the last thing we want to talk about this evening is stock plus options. Yeah, well, just, Tracy, just, you know, send me an email so I'll, I'll have a list of people who want the deck, so. All right, so now the last thing we want to talk about this evening is uh, stock plus options. And boy, you got to be careful. You can't let the option tail wag the stock dog. So as a test taker, the minute you see the shares, you got to stop and say, okay, am I being asked about a speculative strategy? Yeah, as I said, send me an email. Don't, the chat is going to go bye-bye after, after we get done today. So if you want the deck, send me an email. I'll put my email up there. I'm not going to be reviewing the chat after I hit the, the end button. So if, if you want the deck, send me an email, deandenny uh, at gmail.com, I'll send you the deck. All right, so stock position plus option position. You always got to stay focused on the stock. And hedge means offset risk. You know, hedges keep good things in and bad things out. And for protection, we're always going to buy the option. And for income, we're going to sell the option. Now, this is where people get hung up. The contract specifications have not changed. It still means that when you're short a call, you've received the premium, you're obligated to sell the stock. It still means when you're long a put, you paid a premium, you have a choice to sell the stock. Contract specifications have not changed, but you can't be using the matrix for gains and losses and break evens because the biggest takeaway is these are stock positions, not option positions. You gotta stay focused on the stock. So let's look at one of these. This is very testable. So when you are looking at this position, the first thing you've got to do as a test taker is recognize that you're looking at a stock position. And that's what dominates. So when you see this 100 shares, buy 100 shares, you immediately know this is a bullish transaction. You say, well, Justine, I thought a short call is bearish. No, the dominant position is the stock. So it does not matter. It does not matter what comes next. If you own the stock, if you have a long or short stock position, that's what dominates. Is that long or short stock position? Okay, so I buy 100 shares of Apple at 154. Chat is open. Is that 154, is that 154 dollars out or dollars in? Is that 154? Dollars out or dollars in? That is dollars out. And when you write the uh, Apple September 60 at 160 call. Now, again, I suggested that what you might want to consider doing is underneath every option leg, say, what are you looking at? You're looking at an obligation to sell 
the stock at the strike price. You know, I like to put that under the leg there to kind of see what's going on in terms of the stock. Now, remember, your the call is the tail. Don't let the tail wag the dog. Well, Apple's trading it. Doesn't matter where Apple's trading at. We just told you you bought it at 154. So Apple was at 154 when you bought it. Now it does matter what you paid for the stock. We bought the stock at 154. So when Apple, we bought it, it was 154. Right? They're not going to say on this one, they're not going to say Apple's at 154. Test phraseology. Your customer buys 100 shares of Apple, 154, and writes one Apple September 160 call at seven. What is the break even? What is the break even? Well, you're getting, you're going backwards on us. There's nothing here about out of the money or in the money. It has nothing to do with answering this question. What we have to do to answer this question about break even is figure out what we're net out of pocket for the stock. So is that seven? Is that going to be money out or money in? Is that seven money out or money in? Yeah, how do I know it's money out? Because when you buy stock, you're paying for it, right? If you buy 100 shares of Apple at 154, that's money out. You're going to owe me $15,400. So that's how we know that's money out. Buy means money out. Sell means money in. Buy money out, right? If you write a check, if you go buy something tonight and you write a check, it's going to be money out. It's going to be money out. All right, so one thing you can memorize and I told you, this is where memorize. Once you go down that road, this is the one time and the one time only that it's not going to be call up. It's going to be the stock cost minus the premium for our break even. That's going to be our break even. And again, you can either memorize that or you can get the T fired up. I think the T is the better way to go. But uh, the stock cost, we paid 154 for the stock. We brought in seven points for the, uh, the call. So we did get some price decline protection. So our break even is 154 minus seven. I'm terrible at arithmetic, so I'm not kidding. I'm grabbing my calculator, minus seven. My break even is 147. Now, as we mentioned, you can either uh, you know memorize that or you could simply shop your answer set and know that the break even is going to be the number that makes the columns balance right because that's what break even is same dollars out as dollars in so this is bullish because the stock dominates and our break even is 147 you know if i net those two numbers right again there's a lot of ways to go but i'm out 147 for the stock excuse me 154 for the stock and i brought in seven points for the option so i'm net out of pocket 147. That's just what that looks like in terms of arithmetic. All right? That's my break even. Now, there is a disadvantage. The break even is not 161. Romeo, it's not 161. 61, I make money. I would deliver the stock at 160. We don't put 160 into the credit column unless we get called away. This is the only time. 160, Romeo, is when the stock gets called away. It hasn't done that. Yet. We're doing our initial setup. So here, the question, test question says, your customer buys 100 shares at 154, dollars out. Your customer writes, one Apple September 160, call at seven, dollars in. What is the break even? 147. I paid 154 the stock, 154 for the stock. I brought in seven points for the option. Yes, we subtract the premium. This is the one time and the one time only we subtract the premium because this is an option position. So this is why I said, you got to really change gears intellectually when you get the stock plus the option. One of the things they'll offer you on the test is 167. If this was just a naked call, let me just show that to you. If that's all we were looking at, the break even would be 167, right? So that's why you got to be careful. This is not a naked call. This is a covered call. Right, so that's why you got to be careful. Yeah, well, that's the point of coming to the session, Romeo. That's a big one. That's a big, big white bull kind of moment on this thing. Now, there is a disadvantage. So you asked Romeo, why don't we put 160? 160 is when the stock gets called away from us. Now, that's the disadvantage of the strategy is we don't participate past the strike price. 
we don't participate past the strike price. We're going to have to give up the stock at 160. If we didn't want to give up the stock at 160, we shouldn't have collected that premium. We shouldn't have collected, whoa, what did I do there? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Hold on, I just, my computer just went kind of on the fritz. I mean, just a sec here. All right, Dean's back in business, but I got to erase that. That was a mistake. Um, okay, so uh, we have here our N of seven. And you asked me, Romeo, when does this credit go over here? in terms of dollars out or dollars in. You know, the debit is the same as cash out or dollars in, right? And that would be when it gets exercised. So I call you, I say, hey, Romeo, you know the Apple stock in your account? You say, yeah, Dean, I uh, got that Apple stock at 154. I brought in seven. I got some price decline protection. I lowered my out-of-pocket cost from 154 to 147. Why are you bothering me? And I say, well, you got exercised. And you say, well, I have to deliver the stock. I go, indeed you do. So you don't participate past the strike price. So the best case scenario here, Romeo, is you bought net out of pocket at 147 and you deliver the stock at 160. And so the most you can make here is the break even to the strike. You know, in this case, 13 points. Now, cover calls sound pretty good. So let me just tell you what I mean by that. Cover calls sound pretty good. I say, Romeo, how would you like to get paid $700 in advance, $700 in advance to agree to sell Apple stock high that you bought low? Somebody will give you $700 to agree to sell Apple at 160 that you bought at 154. You go, wow, that sounds pretty decent. I just say, yeah, you can uh, you know, make three sources of profit here, Romeo. You make the difference between 154 and 160, six points there, plus the seven points. So the most you can make is 13 points. You also get dividends along the way. So the biggest test question here is why do we do it? We do it, test question to generate additional income. That's very testable. So Romeo calls me, says, hey, Dean, I like my Apple stock, but you know, it doesn't pay much in the way of dividends. I wish there were a way to supplement or generate additional income. I say, Romeo, are you familiar with a covered call or buy right? Why don't we agree to sell high your Apple stock? If you'll agree to sell it at 160, you know, we can get seven points for that. He said, well, I thought writing calls was very dangerous. I say, well, no, 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 no. Naked uncovered calls are very dangerous, but not covered calls. Covered calls are one of the safest things you can do because you're actually agreeing to sell stock that you own, that you own. <laughs> okay, well, that's all right, Romeo. Remember, it's being recorded. So if you have to check out a little early, it's not a problem. And then the max loss, you do get some price decline protection, but that's not why you do it, right? What I mean by that is you're out 154 for the Apple stock and the uh, you know zero is still where it could go to. So, but you get to keep the seven. So the most you can lose here is when the stock goes from the break even uh, to zero. That's the best case scenario, our worst case scenario, right? Is that Apple is zero? And you would tell me that the worst case here is we're gonna lose $147 a share times one times 100. Okay, so that is a covered call. That is a covered call. And uh, you know, again, the two biggest test questions on the covered call or can you do the break even? Stock cost minus premium, and do you uh, understand the max gain is capped? You don't participate past the strike price. The next thing we want to be able to do is protect a stock position. Protect a stock position. So uh, here we are buying a protective put. Uh, page 104 is just where I grabbed the slide out of a, a, a other deck I was using. So that has nothing to do with our conversation. So a chance to redeem ourselves. So again, what you want to do is practice, drill, and rehearse. So what is the dominant thing here? We got two things going on. What is dominant? You're buying 100 shares of Apple or buying the put? Because if you tell me that you're buying the put is dominant, you're going to tell me you're a bear. 
If you're telling me the stock is dominant, you're going to tell me you're a bull. So are you a bull or a bear? What is the dominant position here? The shares or the put contract? The shares, the put contract, what is dominant? You are correct, Erica. This is a bullish transaction because stocks always dominate. So the minute as a test taker, you see buy the 100 shares, you say, I don't care what comes next. This is a bullish position. All right, so, and then we said in terms of process, what we want to do is underneath the option leg or somewhere say, what are we looking at? We're looking at a choice to sell the stock at the strike price. Particularly on puts, boy, you really want to do that. Now, what we're actually doing here is putting in a floor. We're putting in a floor at 150. Okay, so you want to get better at tracking money. So tracking money. So is the 154 money out or money in? Is the 154 money out or money in? That is money out. And is that uh, three, is that money out or money in? When you buy that put, is that money out or money in when you buy a put? When you buy a put, that's money out. So we're out 154 for the stock. We're out three points for the protection. Now, again, ladies and gentlemen, you got to be really careful again, because if you thought this was just this, if this was just a September 150 put, you would tell me the break even is 147. But remember, this is not a put. That is the tail. You don't want the tail wagging the dog. So this is the one time and the one time only that you're going to add when you have a put to get the break even. The break even is going to be the stock cost plus the premium. This is the one time and the one time only that you're going to be adding in a put contract because again, this is not a put contract. Remember we said what dominates is the stock position. And so if you don't wanna memorize that, if you don't wanna memorize that, you could simply get your T and say, okay, it's gonna be the stock cost plus the premium. And I, as you can tell, I'm a big believer and if you practice drill and rehearse and you get good at the T, then you don't need to memorize a bunch of stuff because you can just, you know, get your T fired up and say, okay, my break even is going to be 157. And I'll put that in there. I'm out uh, for the Apple, 154. I'm out three points for the protection. So what I'm out total is 157. That's my break even. And then I can just put that over here. That's our break even. I'm just trying to get as smooth as smaller as we can put it over there. Okay, so uh, max gain. Now this is kind of cool. This is kind of cool. Our max gain is still unlimited because we don't have to sell the stock if we don't want to. We don't have to sell the stock if we don't want to. So we still have unlimited gain potential. We have unlimited gain potential because again, we're out 154 for the stock. We're out three points for the protection. And we don't have to sell, we don't want to. Now I think you're, it's kind of like buying term insurance on the stock position. I kind of think you're a jerk of a customer if Apple goes to like 200 and you say, Dean, had I just bought the Apple at 154 and it's at 200, I would have made 46 points, but I wasted my money for the put. I go, well, no, no, no. I mean, the put isn't about what if we're right. The put is about what if we're wrong. You know, we're going to sleep a little better knowing that anytime we want, we can exercise our put contract. And that's why we do that. You know, without that put, the floor, we said options about floors and ceilings. If I just buy Apple, if I just buy Apple, and that's all I do, I could lose $154 a share. But, you know, I did some construction. Construction costs money, and I put in a floor at 150. So I'm out 154 for the Apple. 
I'm out three points for the protection. And anytime I want, I can sell the stock. Anytime I want, I can sell that stock at 150. Right? So the most I can lose is the break even to the strike price. Pretty cool, right? That's the most I can lose. You know, if I want, I could subtotal this. Boom. And when we do that, we get 157. And 150. Pretty cool. Okay, so suitability, why do we do this? This is pretty bueno. The reason we buy a protective put, test question, is to have the ability to participate in a big price increase, but not participate in a big price decline. Pretty cool. You know, one time I had a doctor client drove me nuts. We got really lucky. We bought the stock at 90. We bought the stock at 90. Is that dollars out or dollars in if we buy the stock at 90? Dollars out or dollars in if we buy the stock at 90? Yeah, and then the stock went to 180. We got lucky. And I wanted him to buy a 175 put at four. If we buy the put at four, is that going to be dollars out or dollars in? If we buy a 175 put at four, that's going to be dollars out. So we would have been out 90 for the stock, four points for the protection. So we're out 94. That's our break even. I said, doctor, if we're out 94 and we can sell at 175, we would have a guaranteed profit. There'd be no way for us to lose money in this position. So that's why I'm suggesting that we buy a protective put. We buy some insurance. I couldn't believe what he said to me. He said, Dean, do you get a commission if I do that? I wasn't even thinking about my commission. I want to say, doctor, if I was after a commission, I'd put a, a sell stop at like $179.99 and get you bumped out of the stock. <laughs> you know. Anyways, uh, he didn't buy the protection. The stock came all the way back down. So it was kind of fun. I got to call him every day and say, listen, had we bought the protection, if we'd bought the insurance, we'd be okay right now because every dollar we'd be losing it in the stock, we could make it up in that put contract. So, you know, oh, well, what could have been? What could have been? All right, so that's our long stock positions. Now, the last thing I want to show you this evening is uh, being a, a short stock position. And again, what we're doing is practicing our mechanics, practicing our mechanics. Uh, I got two here. I got a couple practice questions here for you. Uh, chat is open. So if I have a customer who wants to generate income, on their stock position. This answer set, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is so, so important. We have two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can buy them or sell them. So that answer set is huge. So to generate income, it's not long a call because if you go long a call, you're gonna pay. That's gonna be money out. So income is gonna be money in. Nope, you're not gonna do a short put. You don't want to have an obligation to buy to generate income on your stock position. You're going to do a covered call. You're going to do a covered call. You're going to do B. Very testable to know that covered calls are used to generate additional income, right? The way we generate additional income on our Apple stock is by selling the 160 call at seven, right? So that's very testable. Why do we do a covered call? to generate additional income. Oh, my example, my bad, that's the income one, so that's B. And then protection. Protection, the answer is gonna be C, right? We're gonna buy a put. So you're either gonna be asked on the test, how do you generate income? You do a covered call, you do B, test question. How do you protect a stock position? You go buy a put, a protective put. So you're either gonna do a covered call or a protective put. So the answer is either gonna be a, uh, B or C. You want to be able to do the offset, by the way. So what we mean by that is if you bought the stock, you want to be able to sell it. So you should have been able to get that to a 50-50. But that answer set is really, really, really important. So, all right. So last thing I want to show you this evening is uh, how to be a smart bear and not be a dumb bear. So, you know, if you just short the stock, if all you do is short Apple stock, you would have on 
limited loss potential. Because there'd be no ceiling, right? If that's all you did was short 100 shares of Apple at 154, you would have unlimited risk. Now, remember, if we have stock and options, what's going to be the dominant position? What is the dominant position? The dominant position when you have stock and options is always the stock, right? Okay. Well, remember, we're going to have a recording. So if you have to leave a little bit, you know, I told you, I appreciate your patience because these are the first times I'm offering these evenings. So I don't know basically what the time is because usually we would be doing a four-day class and I would know where we're at at any given time. So when we're doing these like kind of carve outs, you know, so maybe in the future, what I'll do is make it two lectures instead of a one 90 minute one. But anyways, uh, I appreciate that, but no worries. Uh, it'll be recorded. And then remember, you also have the free office hour available to you as well. So, okay. So uh, I do want to finish up. We're close. I, you know, we're close to the finish line. So <laughs> be patient. Okay. So uh, what's dominant here, the stock or the option? The stock or the option, what is dominant here? The, the 155 call, because if you tell me the 155 call is dominant, you're going to tell me I'm a bull. If you tell me I'm short the stock, that that's dominant, you're going to tell me I'm a bear. So the stock is dominant. So is this a bullish or a bearish position? Is this a bullish or a bearish position? It doesn't matter what comes after the stock position because the stock position dominates. This is a bearish position. Right. And then we said the other thing you might want to consider doing is underneath the option contract, what you're looking at. This is a very, very smart uh, uh, bear. Because this bear says, you know what, just in case I'm wrong, I think I'll establish the choice to buy back the borrowed stock at a set price, the strike price. And what's so cool about this position, if we have changed the short stock position from unlimited risk to limited risk. Again, I think the best way to get break even is the T. So if we're shorting stock, if we're shorting stock, is that money out or is that money in when we're shorting stock? When we sell short stock, is that money out or money in? Yeah, short is money in. Anytime you ever short something, that means you're collecting money. So we're collecting 154. That is money in when you're short the stock. We buy a 155 call for three. Is that money out or is that money in? When you buy a call, that's going to be money out. And so now we have our break even. Our break even is again the net. When I have buy and a sell, I net. Buy, buy, I add. So here I net the two numbers and my break even is 151. Again, if you get good at the T, you don't have to memorize anything because you know when you shop your answer set as a test taker, that whatever they're offering you has to go into there. By the way, I always put the mechanics, the stock and the option on a different line so that we can track if we have to close out more than one thing. So sometimes you, you, know, you buy the stock and then you buy a put and then you sell a call and you go, oh yeah, you gotta track all that money. Okay, so our break even is 151, right? Because I need a number that if we plug it in there, would make the columns uh, balance. And indeed, that would make the columns balance. So that's my break even. Okay, we, uh, by the way, yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about break even on this one. And I wouldn't worry about max gain. The max gain now is when the stock goes to zero. And I wouldn't worry about that either. Again, I think you're kind of a jerk of a customer if you say, well, geez, Dean, I wasted my money for that call contract. You know, if I didn't buy the call contract, I would have made 154. You know, but that call expired and I wasted my money for on that three points and I only made 151. I said, well, yeah, but you would have had, you know, unlimited loss potential. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you don't do it because of the max gain. You do it here because you're smart enough to know that if you don't have that protection in place, you would have unlimited loss potential. And again, I don't think here I'm doing the numbers, but on the test, I don't think it's the numbers. It's do you realize that this is a very smart bear? A very smart bear because this bear is buying protection. Remember, protection means you're always buying the option. That's what protection always means, that you're buying the option contract. And so now, anytime I want, I can close this out 
at the strike price. Again, I don't think you have to be able to detract the money. I think you just got to be able to uh, do this. I too am running over, so just a sec. I got a guy with tutoring. <laughs> but you know, who's more important to me? My 10 students that paid me $40 or this guy who paid me 225. What is the dominant position? 10 people at 45 bucks? Or what I charge you? I charge you 45 or 40? I forget what I charge you guys. Did I charge you 40 or 45? I kind of make it up as I go. So <laughs> 45. So that's $450. And his hour is going to be $225. So who's more important? You guys. <laughs> I'm joking. He's a good guy. I've been working for him a while. So if he's a new person, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so uh, flippant with it. Uh, anyways, we're going to finish up. We're going to get to the finish line here. Okay. So suitability. What we need to know here is this is just a very smart bear because this person no longer has unlimited loss potential, right? Because if that's all you did was short that stock, you would have unlimited loss potential. Right, So this is just a smart way to proceed. And remember, the big thing is protection costs money. Now, here's a dumb bear. Last thing tonight, here is a dumb bear. Yeah, a dumb bear. And why is this guy a dumb bear on Apple? Why is this person a dumb bear? So again, what I suggest we always do is underneath the position, say, what are we looking at? We're looking at an obligation to buy the stock at the strike price. Now, by the way, I would continue to do that as you're you know, studying. Every time you get one of these things, I would do that just to try and get more comfortable with contract specifications. Because if you get good at contract specifications, in other words, you're not fumbling around, that there's an obligation to buy the stock at, uh, at uh, 140. You know, you're, and you can track money, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Uh, so we have a shorting the stock and we have shorting the put. So what is Donna? Short put and you're bullish because if it's a short put, it was just a short put, you'd be bullish. Or is it short the stock? What is dominant? Short the stock or short the put? What is the dominant position? What is the dominant position? As a test taker, every time you see the shares, that is the dominant position. So when you're short the Apple stock, are you a bull or a bear if you're short Apple stock? You say, Dean, what's your position in Apple? I say, I'm short the stock. Am I a bull or a bear? I'm a bear. And now we're gonna decide, is Dean a dumb bear or a smart bear? Okay, so now we're gonna track money. So is the 154, is that money out or money in? money in, right? That's money in. When you sell stock, that's money in. That's a short position. Short is always money in. And what about that short put? Is that money out or money in? Is that short put money out or money in? That's money in as well. So again, if you get good at the T, you get the contract specifications. Now you know what the break even is, right? We brought in 154 for the stock. We brought in another seven points for the option. And again, if you get good at that, then you just know that when you shop your answer set, you need a number that if you plug it in there would make the columns balance because that's what break even is. It's the same dollars out as dollars in. So you did get some price protection if it goes up. If Apple goes up until it goes past 161, you got no problem. Your max gain is when the put gets exercised. Again, on these ones, ladies and gentlemen, it's not so much the numbers, it's do you understand what is a smart bear and what is a dumb bear? And this is a very, very dumb bear because if you're right and you get exercised on the put, that is your max gain. The test question is, why is this a dumb bear? Does anybody see a problem with this position? Does anybody see a problem with this position? This is the test question. You have not effectively hedged this position, 
right? You still have unlimited risk potential here because if the stock is 140 or higher, the put just expires and you're still hanging in the wind. So what you've got to recognize on the test is that this is not an effective hedge, meaning it does not work. It kind of works, but you don't want to hedge that kind of works. You want one that works, right? And this one kind of works. So you don't want that. So what you have to recognize is that this position still has unlimited loss potential because we don't know, again, how far Apple could move. This doesn't give you effective protection. You know, we have effective protection, effective hedges and partial hedges. And this is partial. Yeah, this has unlimited loss potential. And that's the test question. Let me show you this as a test question. So what gives the customer the most protection in a short stock position? So remember, you should have been able to get this to a 50-50 pretty quickly because you should know that protection is going to be buying an option. So you should have been able to get this to this or this pretty quickly because you should know that protection means buying the option. You know, income is short, right? So yeah, it's going to be the long call. Choice A, very testable. By the way, I think you're going to have to do that and not really track all the money in and out, just recognizing the effective hedge. Uh, here's just a summary of that. So if you're long the stock, what is your market attitude if you're long the stock? Are you a bull or a bear if you're long the stock? You remember you're bullish and it doesn't matter what option position we do next. It doesn't matter. So your market attitude is that you're bullish, right? So the appropriate hedge, you already own the stock. So you want to be able to sell the stock, right? You own the stock, you're going to want to sell it. So that means you're either going to do a short call or you're going to do a long put. You're either interested in income or protection. So you can either do a partial hedge it eh, kind of works. You get some income or you can do an effective hedge. So if you're interested in income, you're going to sell the call. But if you're interested in protection, you're going to buy a put, right? That's the full hedge. That's the hedge that works. And, you know, that's going to cost you some money. By the way, I'm not going to go in that tonight, but, you know, in advanced option strategy, we do both. We do both. It's called a caller. Okay. Now we're short the stock. What are we bullish or bearish if we're short the stock? If we're short the stock, are we a bull or a bear? We are a bear and it doesn't matter what comes next, right? And if we're short the stock, we wanna be able to buy back the borrowed stock. We either gonna be a smart bear and have a choice to buy back the borrowed stock, long call, or we're gonna be a dumb bear and have an obligation to buy back the borrowed stock. You know, the choice is the more effective hedge, the full hedge. The obligation is the partial hedge. And then remember, the partial hedge here still exposes you to unlimited risk. And by the way, that's the only one that has unlimited risk. The long stock, long put doesn't have unlimited risk. The long stock, short call doesn't have unlimited risk. The short stock, long call doesn't have unlimited risk. But yeah, short the stock and selling a put has unlimited loss potential. Okay, well, uh, we finished. I'll make this either a two-hour lecture. I do appreciate your input. There is reviews available on the, the thing. Uh, but backstage, you know, I'm not, I'm, this is just backstage. I'm asking you not as somebody who's going to review the class, but just, you know, in the future, uh, whether this should be two one hour lectures or, you know, I, I tried to get the seven in there. So timing may be a little off. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, uh, whether you think this should be, you know, uh, basic options and then a separate lecture on stock plus options. Uh, if you want, you can unmute yourself. We're officially done uh, with our session. So any questions here before we call it a night? Full, you like it as a full session? Well, thanks, Elizabeth. It was, it's a long, it's long, you know, or maybe I'll put my, uh, my thing in there. So let me just do that. Here my, here my email is, uh, let me put it in there, Dean Tenney. You know, well, the other thing we could consider is in the future, maybe taking a break halfway and, and taking 15 minutes and people could go give refreshments or whatever. So that might be something to consider. Now, remember you guys, there's my email. I just put it in the chat. You guys get free repeats when you see this come up again as a class whether I cut it and make it one or make it two, you get a free repeat on any class that shows up that says basic options or stock plus options. 
Remember, there's also now an office hour available to paid students, whether you paid me for tutoring or you pay me for a class, that office hour is available, it's free. It's not available to people who are just doing live streams. It's, you know, people who are, you know, spending money on the channel. Uh, next week, we'll do straddles and spreads. I don't have a hard close next week. I think I got enough time to do all that. But again, I don't have a hard close like I do tonight. I'm a little late for a tutoring session after this. But uh, next week, we don't need to worry about that. I'm going to, I got to get better on that part too, you know, putting it where I, you know, I'm not conflicting with other, other things. Uh, anything else? Yeah, that's a good idea, Jackie. I like that. So maybe start earlier. I'm starting the live streams now at five. What do you think? Early afternoon? I'm in Vegas. So four o'clock, Jackie, I'd be interested in that as well. So either email or review. Uh, no. Yes, please. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, Spreads and straddles is next week, Juan. So that's going to be Wednesday, 5.30 p.m., 90 minutes again. It's uh, $60 for that session. And uh, this one was recorded and it'll be as, are available as a replay on the uh, channel as well. The advantage when people sometimes say, well, why should I pay for it if, you know, I can get it as a replay? Well, you know, if you pay for it, you can ask me questions along the way and you can be engaged with us as we uh, go to it. So that's what I would think if I were a test taker, do I want to be active participant or do I want to, you know, I think being actively participating and like we are tonight is a, a better learning experience than watching a video replay, but you know, it's up to you. Um, you get off at five Pacific. Yeah, I think that's the challenge, right? Is we got East Coast, West Coast people. Uh, East Coast, I find five somewhere around there kind of gets it for, that's eight o'clock for you guys on the East Coast. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. You're working till five, Jessica. Does that mean right at five, you, you're, you can stay there and participate? Or does that, that mean that, you know, you're in the commute because you're in Southern California, that could be an hour and a half before you're home and you're, you know, <laughs> with your, with your uh, available Eastern time. Okay. It's a uh, IT community. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, we'll figure all that out. But until we get through the first rotation, it's going to stay the way it is. So that means Wednesday one, five 30 straddles and spreads. I think there's already three people there. I've got it capped at 10, but remember the other thing besides the free office hour, if you see any of the classes I'm offering and it's capped when it's capped, it, when you go to register, it'll say no slots available. But remember for you as a paid student that cap doesn't exist. I can manually just, you know, send me an email or whatever. And I'll manually insert you into the, the class. Uh, I want to keep it about 10 because I think more than that, it gets a little harder for me to monitor chat and see what's up going on. All right. Anything else? Mondays and Fridays. So, yeah, I think I'll probably move it at some point. We'll, we'll move it around. But for this first sequence, we'll get to it once a week. And then I think we'll change the frequency and we'll, we won't mess around too much. Uh, we're just collecting data at this point, right? You guys are kind of a beta in terms of how this will work. Okay, if you have nothing else for me, uh, I will see some of you next Wednesday. Hopefully I'll see all of you Tuesday for the live stream. Uh, again, the live stream overtime session is already booked completely, but that doesn't apply to you. If you want to join us in the overtime, uh, that's available to you. And if it tells you it's not, just let me know and I'll manually insert you in there. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for participating. And I got to get on to my next tutoring session and I will see you uh, Tuesday. And I'll, if I get the emails, I'll send you the deck as well. Bye-bye.